Well, what do you think when you see a rainbow? What do you, what do you see when you see a rainbow? What does a rainbow mean to you? Actually, that question about the meaning of the rainbow caused a lot of controversy back in 2020. Do you remember it? Um, remember when people started putting that little blue and white NHS logo on the rainbow flag in 2020? Do you remember when people started painting rainbows in their windows? And we all had to go out and clap at certain times of the day for clap for the NHS. Some of you were working exceedingly hard in very difficult circumstances uh, through those days. Why a rainbow? I mean, what, what was the idea in painting a rainbow in your window? Um, well, it was obviously to show some kind of support for the hardworking people in the NHS, right? I mean, that was the, that was the basic gist of it. Why a rainbow? Well, the, the rainbow was adopted because it was a symbol of hope. It's kind of a statement that you're making. If you're from my generation, there's always sunshine after rain. You remember the lyrics to that song. So why? No, don't go there. Um, <laughs> but... There's always sunshine after rain. The rain, the sun shines through and there's the rainbow. It's a symbol of hope. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, this trial will come to an end. Keep going, NHS. Keep going. Keep working and saving lives. That was the basic idea in the rainbow, wasn't it? It was a message of, of hope, but it did cause a bit of controversy. They just happened to put the blue and white NHS logo on the six-striped rainbow flag, which happens to be the gay pride flag. There are seven colors in the rainbow, and they picked the six-colored gay pride flag, and that upset a lot of people. Most people didn't notice. Most people weren't that fussed, even if they did notice. Um, but there were a lot of people from the LGBT lobby who were very upset. Why? Well, because that's our flag, they said. <laughs> um, that, that flag for them means LGBT pride. I read a number of articles. I wasn't too interested in the controversy at the time. We had other things going on, but I read a number of articles just recently. And the gist of it, according to the LGBT folk who were complaining about the use of the flag by the NHS, uh, the gist of it is that the rainbow had been their symbol for over 40 years. <laughs> and how dare the NHS change the meaning of the rainbow? <laughs> None of the articles I read seem to notice the irony in that argument. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty ironic argument. For more than 40 years, for a lot, lot longer, <laughs> the rainbow had a meaning, didn't it? Um, what does the rainbow mean? What does the rainbow actually mean? If you don't believe in God as the creator of everything, well, the rainbow doesn't mean anything, does it? I mean, if, if we are indeed the product of some great cosmic accident billions and billions of years ago, if nothing somehow blew up and created everything, if we're just the, if we're just the product of stardust coalescing into a solar system and then somehow life springing out of primeval soup in a swamp somewhere. I mean, if that's the reality, if we are the product of just random chance applied over billions and billions of years and, and life and everything is just physical, if it is just the product of this physical universe which somehow came into existence by itself... If that's it, then, then a rainbow has no meaning, does it? Rainbow means nothing. It's just light, refracted, reflected 
and dispersed through water droplets suspended in the atmosphere. That's it. Now, if that's what you believe, if you believe it's just physics, well, you'd be right to believe it, that there is physics going on. Um, you can write out a mathematical equation. I was going to read it to you, but then I realized that I didn't understand it. Um, I would have understood it once upon a time, but my physics and my mathematics is not uh, that level anymore. And that equation was beyond me. You can go to it. The Wikipedia article on rainbows will give you the, 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 the equation. You can, you can actually program it in and... It's, it's, you say it's just laws, it's mathematical laws of physics, and you can, you can break it down. Yes, but you see, when you can be right about all of that, but if you leave God out of the equation, you say, well, you're leaving out an essential part, aren't you? Because according to the Bible, do you believe the Bible? Do you believe, do you believe God actually, you're in church, do you believe God actually created everything. God is the ultimate cause. Do you believe God, when you come to the Bible, you come to Genesis 1 and God spoke and said, let there be light and there was light. Do you believe that? Do you believe that's the origin of everything? Well, you come into Genesis and you come to Genesis chapter 1, you say, well, God is the originator, but God is more than just an originator. He's a revealer. He spoke. And you come to Genesis 9, and in Genesis 9, we read that he set his bow in the clouds. And so if you believe in this God of the Bible, you believe that God put the rainbow there. And I'm not saying there are no laws of physics. I believe it all. But you say God created things this way so that the rainbow has a meaning. A meaning. And the question then is, well, what <laughs> is the meaning of the rainbow? What is the meaning of the rainbow? In Genesis chapter 9, the passage we've got to, God tells us what the rainbow means. <laughs> Verses 12 to 17, God tells you what you are supposed to think when you see a rainbow. If you're ready for it, that's the substance of today's message. Um, Genesis chapter 9, verses 12 to 17. I just want to show you what God wants you to think when you see a rainbow. You say, well, that seems like a strange um, sermon kind of aim a proposition, as we call it, in preaching science. Seems like a strange thing to want to, to communicate. Well, yes, but actually there's a point to all this, and we'll come to the point of it all at the end. And I want to show you first what God wants you to think when you see a rainbow. It's really simple. I only have one point to make, which is that when you see a rainbow, it means that God wants you to think this. God will not forget his covenant. God will not forget his covenant. We get that from beginning in verse 12 all the way through verse 17, um, but we get it from the sign of the covenant here. It talks, it talks here about the rainbow as being the sign. Verse 12, let's pick it up. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. And you want to know what the sign is? Verse 13, I have set my bow. God has set his bow in the cloud. And it, that's obviously the rainbow, isn't it? It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So the rainbow is the sign, a sign of the covenant. And a sign is something 
that points to something else, isn't it? It's very simple. Uh, you can say here in these few verses, verse 12 through to verse 17, God is now explaining the sign of the covenant that he's just made. Um, he's explaining that the sign, the rainbow, points to the covenant, and there are four things in this passage that the the rainbow is pointing us to. Four things about the covenant that the rainbow is pointing us to. So if you're taking notes, I've got one point, and now you know I've got four subpoints. So here we go. Let me walk you through very quickly um, these four things that the sign of the covenant points to. Now, first of all, the rainbow points is a sign that points to the fact the fact of the covenant. The fact of the covenant. You see a rainbow and it says, God made a covenant. Uh, when you get married, uh, you make a covenant with your wife or your husband. And in our culture, you make your vows. That's your covenant. And you give them a ring. Um, the ring is a sign of the covenant that you have made. It points to the vows that you've made. It points to the fact that you've made the vows. And it's there as a reminder. You can say that the rainbow is like a ring on God's finger that is reminding God that he made a covenant, as if God needed a reminder. Um, it points to the reality that the covenant exists. It points to the fact of the covenant. So that's the first point, the fact of the covenant. And secondly, uh, the rainbow is a sign that points to the parties of the covenant. Um, the rainbow says that God made the covenant with everything and every one. Look at verse 12 again. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between, between me and you. Now, earlier on in the passage, God said, I'm going to establish the covenant with you and your descendants after you and so on. It was all with, with, with. Now the language changes and here it's all between and, and that's pointing us to the fact of the parties of the covenant. Between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Look at verse 13 now. Verse 13 at the end. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and and the earth, even the inanimate earth, is a party to the covenant. Verse 15, and my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. That's every animal everywhere. Verse 16, the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. That's every creature everywhere. Verse 17, the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. I mean, this... This is God repeating himself, isn't it? Why would God do that? Because he wants you to know, okay, this is the, the sign. When you see a rainbow, what are you supposed to think? What's it pointing to? It's pointing to the fact of the covenant, yes, but it's pointing to the fact that the covenant is made between parties. And the parties here is a God on one side, between God and literally everything and everyone including the earth itself. And that's pretty crazy, isn't it? Is it my ears or have I just gone echoey? Okay, are you, are you okay down there? Oh, it's my ears. That doesn't surprise me. There's, there's strange things happening in the cavities in my head thanks to some bug that's fighting me. Uh, but I'm going to win. Um, <clears throat> now... Um, it, this is actually really significant if you're saying about the parties of the covenant because obviously that includes us um, late, it includes you now later on God is going to make a covenant with Abraham and he's going to say I'm giving you this I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make a name for you and I'm going to give you this land that you're in. Walk through the land. And this is the land which is going to be actually given to you and your offspring after you. Now you may, one or two of you, may be the offspring of Abraham in this room. 
but most of us are Gentiles. <laughs> most of us are not. And, and that covenant was not made with you. It was not made to you. But this one is. The parties of the covenant are important, aren't they? You can't go to Israel and say, I claim this land unless you're a biological descendant of Abraham. But right here, this, this includes us. It also includes the animals. It also includes the earth. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because that leads me on to the third thing the rainbow points to. First, first of all, it points to the fact of the covenant. Then it points to the parties of the covenant. Now, thirdly, the rainbow points to the nature of the covenant. And this is interesting because God is making a covenant here. Uh, and you say, what kind of a covenant is it? Is it, is it like a contract? Is it, is it like, okay, this is my part and this is your part, says God? And, and these are the stipulations, these are the contractual obligations that you're under. And so you can break it if you, if you break this if you fail at this point, it's over. Is it a two-sided covenant in that way? Is God saying, I won't ever destroy the earth with a flood again if you fulfill these obligations? Is he saying, as long as you keep your side of the bargain, I will keep my side of the bargain? No, actually, it's not that. It's a one-sided covenant, a unilateral covenant. Look at verse 14. God says, when I bring clouds over the earth and the, the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters, of the, the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. This is like a ring on God's finger that God put there on his own finger to, remind, to say, look, I made a promise. I have covenanted to be faithful, not to destroy the earth, no matter what. God says, never again, never again. And people say that, don't they? People say never again, a lot. They said never again after World War I. It wasn't called World War I, it was called the Great War. But then there was World War II. <laughs> And everyone had to say, oops. They said, never again after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And now you're looking at the world and wondering, well, does, does that really mean never again? Is there going to be nuclear war? And you say, well, I just don't know if I can trust people. And the right answer to that is, no, you can't trust people. But when God says never again, can you trust God? That's the question. Can you? If you can't trust God when he says never again, you cannot trust God. Go home. Give up. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Make the most of it. This is all you've got. But if you can trust God, if when God says never again, he means never again, oh, that, that has big implications for you and for me and for everyone in, the, in this world, doesn't it? And, and I'm saying you can. You, you can trust God. You can trust God, and, and this is kind of like one of these test cases, isn't it? You can trust God. God is saying, you can, you can trust me for this. God is saying, here's a rainbow. And what does it point to? It points to the fact that I have made a covenant. I have made a covenant. And when I see the bow, I will remember my covenant. And I will never again flood the world like I did. I will not destroy the world in that way. It's not going to happen. Never again. I am never going to forget my covenant. You can't break my covenant. It's nothing to do with you. And I won't break it. That's what God is saying, right? And that's pretty significant, isn't it? So, the rainbow points us to the fact of the covenant. It points us to the parties of the covenant. It points us to the nature of the covenant. Now, fourthly, it points us to the duration of the covenant. The duration of the covenant. The rainbow 
says the meaning of the rainbow here says God made a covenant that is everlasting everlasting verse 16 when the bow is in the clouds I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature on of all flesh that is on the earth now uh, literally in Hebrew berit olam berit covenant olam of the ages <laughs> Covenant of the ages. Now, this is awesome. This is like the covenant that lasts for all the ages. Lasts to the ages. Through the ages. As long as the earth remains. Seed time and harvest and so on. As long as the earth remains, God says. As long as it, this is this age, this, this era Listen, the earth, this present earth, the earth that God made in the beginning, the world that God flooded and destroyed, the world that then existed, Peter says, perished, but now we've got this earth, and this earth that we're living in now, this world that exists, has a lifetime warranty signed by God. <laughs> It is not going to expire. It's going to be destroyed by fire one day. One day it's all over. But actually this present world has a lifetime guarantee. Now that's really important, isn't it? This is, um, why, am I, why am I going through all this? This is painfully basic, isn't it? This is kind of Sunday school stuff. But it's actually totally foundational for your worldview. This is why children need to be taught this from the youngest age. God isn't going to let the world go out of control. God isn't going to let the climate go out of control. God isn't going to let this world be destroyed by an asteroid or, or even finally self-destruct with nuclear war. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything in the Bible to say that there can never be a nuclear war. I wonder sometimes if that's what's going to happen, if we're all going to go back to the um, dark ages and, and we're going to be in a nuclear winter and end up fighting with swords and shields like it seems to say that there will be in Revelation. Or I wonder if those prophecies are going to be fulfilled by some kind of, you know, the swords and the shields and the horses mean mean um, tanks and things like helicopters and you know, things like that. I don't know. I haven't figured all that out, but, to be honest. But um, I've got nothing in the Bible that says the world could never have a nuclear war. That's impossible. But I have got something in the Bible that says the world, we are not going to destroy this world. This world is not so fragile that we're going to actually push it over the edge into self-destruct and it's going to be game over. We're not going to hit that we're not going to hit that end of the game that says game over ourselves. We cannot do that, and no one else can do that, and no accident can do that. Why? Because God's given a lifetime guarantee to the planet. And this is foundational. Um, this is the, what you should think when you see a rainbow. <laughs> you see a rainbow, what are you supposed to think? God will not forget his covenant. That's it. It's my one point for the sermon. Is that okay? You want to go home? <laughs> I'm not done, but you know, that's kind of that's kind of it. It is so foundational as a thought, isn't it? That I think it, it would do us well to spend a little while just thinking about that. Um that's what we learn when we see the sign of the covenant in Genesis 9. The sign in Genesis 9 means God will not forget his covenant. Take that with you into your life. Now, um, what we need to think about now is just like, okay, how, how does that impact our understanding of the rest of the Bible, of life in general, of our own spiritual relationship with God, of what we know about our uh, the covenant that we are under, the new covenant. Um, how, how does that impact us? How do we understand this? 
in relation to the rest of Scripture. Um, and as I say, this idea is really foundational. I seem to have lost my time. Oh, that's all right. We're, we're, doing, we're doing great. Okay, good. Um, this idea is like the foundation. And, and I'm, I'm going to say um, it's foundational in different ways. Theologians um, will tell you that there are many covenants in the Bible. Actually, there are six biblical covenants, um, by which I mean that there are six covenants that are actually called covenants by God in the Bible. This is one of them. This is the first one. Now, there, I should say there are theologians called covenantalists, um, and, and they had another three covenants, at least. Some of them had more, but they had another three covenants that the Bible doesn't actually call covenants. Um, I'm going to say that that has a few problems attached to doing that. Uh, it's not to say these people are our enemies. Um, it's not to say there's nothing in what they say either. Um, there are these things that they call covenants are pointing at things which are biblical truths up to a point. Um, where I see the danger is when, when people, as they do, make an interpretive grid a hermeneutical approach, covenantalism is a hermeneutic, when they make an, a hermeneutical grid, you would say a lens through which to see the whole Bible, a grid through which to, in, into which to interpret the whole Bible, when they, they make that out of things that they call covenants that the Bible doesn't call covenants, and then they've got a scheme arranged around that, it can create some problems in interpretation. I'm convinced that it's better to stick to calling things covenants only that the Bible actually does call covenants. And that's where I would differ from my covenantal friends. And these are our friends, not our enemies. Uh, these are people who are believing the same about Christ and the same about so much. Uh, we, we don't want to fight them. But, you know, there are some problems that come with that system of interpretation, I, I believe. Be that as it may, I don't have time to go into it and I don't want to fight over it, but there, there are these six covenants in the Bible that are called a covenant in the Bible and five of them are eternal and unilateral. <laughs> and this is number one. This is the first time. You come to Genesis 6, verse 18, and it's the first time in the Bible the word covenant is used. And it's God telling Noah that he's going to establish his covenant with him. And then in chapter 9, as I explained last time, that's when God says, okay, I'm establishing this with you now. And then, it's, and then he says, I'm doing it. And then he says, I've done it. <laughs> in chapter 9, it's like, this is it. I'm going to do it. Chapter 6, verse 18. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I've done it. In chapter 9. And it's so helpful to understand the tenses of those verbs. You have to go back to the last message for that. But this is the first covenant, and so it's foundational. Um, it's actually foundational for all the other covenants in the Bible, and it's foundational in a couple of different ways, a couple of different ways. So if you're wondering, you're taking notes and you're wondering where this is, well, this is kind of all right, sub point four, sub sub point A. <laughs> this is, I've got two, two different ways in which this covenant is foundational for all the other covenants in the Bible. The first way, one way in which this is a foundation for the other covenants is that the Noahic covenant promises to preserve creation, and that's make, that makes all the other covenants possible. It makes actually all the promise of, promises of God possible well, because God is preserving the creation and he's doing that through this covenant. This is 
If you think of it like this, this covenant that God makes with Noah and with us and with the earth is kind of like God saying, okay, I am going to be patient with the planet. And I'm going to be patient with the planet despite the sinfulness of all the people on the planet. I will not destroy the world like I did in the flood. Now, we said last time and the time before, and we've said it repeatedly, but, but this is God responding, isn't it, to the sacrifice of Noah. When he smelled the pleasing aroma, God decided, God said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground as I have done, and I'll not send a flood. And this is God then, I'm looking, I, I think, Noah's faith in the coming sacrifice this is, this, is, this is God looking at the sacrifice and saying, because, my, because I'm going to send my son to pay for sin, because I'm going to send my son to pay for sin, I am going to be patient with the planet. No matter how sinful men and women are, no matter how many millions of babies they murder, no matter how wicked they become, in their immorality, no matter, I will not do again what I did in flooding the world and destroying the earth. I'm not doing that again, says God. You say, how? Well, this is common grace. I'm going to, I'm going to cause my sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. I'm going to, I'm going to send rain on the, on, on the righteous and the wicked. I'm going to bless everybody. I'm going to be good to all and patient with all. Patience, patience, patience from God. I'm going to be patient with the earth. How? Well, it's paid for at the cross, isn't it? This is, this is cosmic reconciliation, Colossians 1.20. This is, this is Christ even paying for the patience so that God could not just destroy the earth again. But notice that this is a covenant from God to be patient with the planet no matter how sinful the, the people are. He's going to preserve creation. Now that gives us stability to the world. <laughs> and that makes all the promises of God possible then. God can, okay, in the beginning, God said to Adam and Eve, all right, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, have dominion. God's plan um, was originally for mankind to be the ruler over the earth. Adam and Eve, king and queen, <laughs> in the Garden of Eden. And that was the plan for them to have dominion over the planet. Now, God has always been God's plan. This, this creation, this world, um, to be ruled over by people, by men. And, and God isn't going to give up. You know, we come to, the, come to the Noahic covenant, you say, well, God hasn't given up on that plan. This is amazing because God is actually going to bring one day the second Adam to rule and reign. And the second Adam, Christ, has his bride. And, and Jesus and his saints, our Savior and the saints, are going to rule and reign on earth, this earth. And the Noahic covenant in the middle, you see a rainbow, you say God has... God has committed himself to preserving the planet, no matter how bad things get. And, and there's other promises and plans. You know, there's the, the Genesis 3.15 seed promise, and, and God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, the, the offspring of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. You say, well, how is that possible? It can never happen unless God preserves the planet. If God wipes everyone out, the seed promise is gone, and... And, and, and so God saves Noah, and, and he, he promises to preserve the planet, and he gives a stable platform. This is the foundational stable platform upon which all the promises of God can be fulfilled. Are you, are you following me? This is foundational, then, to our understanding of how God is, is uh, carrying out his plans. And so it applies to all the covenants, especially. You say, well, the because the covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and, verse, and chapter 15 and 17, it's kind of reiterated and enlarged. The Mosaic covenant in Exodus 20 and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And, and then there's the priestly covenant, Numbers 25. Remember Phineas and the everlasting covenant, priestly covenant. And then 
Well, there's the, of course, the Moses, the, the, uh, the there's the Davidic covenant, uh, two Samuel seven covenant with David that he's going to have a or he's going to have a son to reign on the throne, and and then there's the new covenant. Adam read it for us earlier in Jeremiah thirty one, and the new covenant is promised to Israel, but it's we're included in that as Christians, and we get to share in the blessings. Jesus says, "This is the new covenant in my blood at the Lord's table," and and so there are these covenants. I'm saying there are six of them that are biblically called covenants, but I'm saying they're all dependent. You would say, in in this first way, they're dependent on the Noahic covenant to provide a stable world. People have called it like a creation kind of covenant. It's a covenant to preserve creation. Are you with me? You're all theologians. All right. That was the one way in which this is a foundational covenant. Another way, second way, in which it's foundational, um, this is the sense that it gives us, it gives us a basic standard of God's care to keep his covenants. I'm sure I could think, if I had time, of a better way of putting that, but you'll have to put up with my lengthy title. It gives us a basic standard of God's care to keep his covenants. It would be so helpful, wouldn't it, if more people understood that when a, a politician can't keep his covenant to his wife, to be faithful to his wife, it means that we can't trust a word he says. Wouldn't it be helpful if more people understood that? Okay. I, well, this is God. <laughs> this is God in heaven making a covenant with the earth, with everyone, with everything, and saying, look, this is like a ring on my finger. It's a bow in the clouds. It's there for you all to see forever. <laughs> Every time I put the bow in the clouds, I will see it and I will remember and I will keep my covenant and you can trust me because you can see that I am keeping my covenants. And you can trust me for everything else because you can see that I keep this covenant. And that's the kind of the point. God is saying, this is who I am. This is what I do. I keep my covenant Therefore, I keep my covenants. And look, look that, that is actually how the Bible many times speaks about the Noahic covenant. When, when God refers back to the Noahic covenant, it's in this sense of saying, look, uh, I keep that, and therefore I will keep this. And that's why I'm saying this covenant is foundational uh, in the sense of being, it gives us the kind of basic standard of God's care to keep his covenant. God is very careful to keep his covenant. He is perfectly careful to keep his covenant. That's the point, okay? Very simple. So with that in mind, what I want to get to now, and we're done, but we're not done, you know that, um, it's kind of a preacher's finally. Um, but with that in mind, what I want to get to is, I want to, I want to get to the point where we can take what we've learned there, God will not forget his covenant. That's what the rainbow means. I want to take that and I want to apply it for us as Christians and leave you with the feeling of, okay, I know then what that means for me today. But before we do that, it would be, Helpful, wouldn't it, to go through the Old Testament and think about when God refers back to the Noahic covenant and, and, look, and, and look at a couple of incidents of when God does that, how did God use that thought with the people of Israel in the Old Testament? So let's do that first, and then we'll come at the end to think about, well, what does that mean for us? So when we see a rainbow... Or should we think as Christians? Okay? Am I making sense? 
So turn to Jeremiah. You knew you, knew you were going to get there in the end, right? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 33 is where we're headed. Jeremiah chapter 33 is the destination. But Jeremiah chapter 33 is the end of a little section. It's sometimes referred to as the, the book of consolation within Jeremiah. It begins in chapter 30. Adam spoke about this earlier when he read it to us. Jeremiah is like judgment, judgment, judgment. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Why? Because he's living in the days in Israel right up to and including the time when they are sent into exile. Poor old Jeremiah. He gets thrown into the pit, sinks down into the mud. He gets his message rejected, rejected, rejected. He ends up saying to the people, don't go to Egypt when everyone else has been taken off into exile and they say, okay, we don't care what you say, we're going to Egypt and we're taking you with us. And poor old Jeremiah. But he was given some amazing prophecies. You remember Daniel was reading the prophecies in Jeremiah? And that's what gave him hope whilst Daniel was in exile in Babylon. He was reading this. And in Jeremiah 30 to 33, 30, 31, 32, 33, just four chapters, it's like a little book of consolation. It's a, it's a ray of sunshine. It's hope. It's hope in the middle of all this Judgment, judgment upon Israel for their sins. But it's hope based around God's promises to Israel and God's, prom God's covenant with Israel. God's covenant with Abraham to the people of Israel, to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who became Israel, and the offspring of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. God's promises to Abraham are going to be picked up in this section and referred to by Jeremiah as promises that God will fulfill and he's going to point to the Noahic covenant as, as like a, see, I do that and I'm going to do this. If I don't do that, I won't do this. That's what we're going to see in Jeremiah 33. You get to the end, have a quick look. At verse 20, thus says the Lord, Jeremiah thirty-three twenty, If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken. That's the Davidic covenant. So that he shall not have a son to reign on, my, on his throne. And my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers, that's the priestly covenant. Now if you go over to verse 25, thus says the Lord, If I have not established my covenant with day and night, and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David my servant. That's the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. And he's saying, if, if I have not established, and I have established my covenant with day and night, if you can break this, and you can't break it because it's a unilateral covenant, and I'm keeping it, I said it, and I'm going to do it, says God, and you can't stop me. <laughs> and, and so, look, if you can stop me, then I'm not going to bless Israel. That's the point. Now, I, that's where we're going in this section. What I want to do now is a very rapid, I know it's going to be rapid, I want to do a very rapid context study for that with you. So you're going to have to follow with me, turn to, to chapter 30, because I want you to get the sense of the physicality, the uh, geographical nature of what is being promised here, the covenantal nature, as in the old the, the Abrahamic covenants, the Davidic covenant, and the priestly covenant nature of the, of the promises God is referencing here to do with Israel and the Jews and what he's promising to keep 
And then we'll come back to that at the end and think about what the rainbow meant for them. So, you ready? Jeremiah 30, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Okay, that's talking about national Israel. Right? In a book, all the words I have spoken to you, for behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord. Israel and Judah, the ten northern tribes, Judah represented the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And I will bring them back to the land. He's talking about the land of Israel. He's talking about the land of Judah. The land that I gave to their fathers, that's referencing the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12 talks about that land, the land of Canaan, the land of promise. And they shall take possession of it. Well, they're just about to go into exile, into Babylon. But now this is the book of consolation. God is promising them restoration. Now, um, verse 4, these are the words of the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Thus says the Lord... We, we have heard a cry of panic and terror and no peace. And there's this picture of them in great distress, verse 7. Alas, for the day is great. There's none like it. This is the distress of the coming judgment upon them. Verse 8. And it shall come to pass in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke. Whose yoke? The yoke of the oppressor from off your neck. And I will burst your bonds. And foreigners, listen, shall no more make servant of him. Make a servant of him. Who's him? Him is Israel, Judah, the people of God. But they shall serve the Lord their God and who? David, their king. But David's dead. David, their king, whom I sh will raise up for them. What's that a reference to? It's a reference to the, the covenant with David that he would raise up one of his offspring, the son of David, to reign on his throne. And what did they call Jesus? Have mercy on us, son of David. Yeah, this is, so, so we're talking about Jesus, but not yet. Okay. So it goes on like this. Um, turn over to verse 18. I'll turn to verse 18 in chapter 30. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwellings. The city shall be rebuilt on its mound. It's very earthly, very geographical, very literal. Verse 22, there's spiritual restoration going on as well. And, and you shall be my people and I will be your God. That's a spiritual restoration, but it's a spiritual restoration of the people of Israel. Now when's all this going to make sense? Verse 24, look at the end of verse 24. In the latter days you will understand this. Well, that's helpful because it's talking about the Jews. And it's saying that in the latter days they're going to understand this. At that time, verse 30, chapter 31, verse 1, at that time, what time? In the latter days, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all, my, all the clans of Israel and they shall be my people. Wow. Wow. So there's coming this time of restoration for the Jews. Um, verse 7 in chapter 31, it's going to be a spiritual restoration, yes, verse 22 in chapter 30, but it's also going to be, you would say, a political restoration. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you come to Deuteronomy, and you, 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 uh, Deuteronomy 28, uh, Leviticus 26, the blessings and the curses. You know that Israel was supposed to be the head and not the tail. And in, in, in Deuteronomy, God promises that they're going to be restored to that, to be the, the chief of the nations. Verse 7 references that. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Yeah, they're going to be restored to be the chief of the nations. There's going to be this political Restoration, look at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. He who scatters Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. 
For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and redeemed him from hands too strong for him. Yes, there's going to be this scattering, this judgment, says Jeremiah. But there's coming a day when there will be a gathering and a restoration. Look at verse 17 in chapter 31. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. Are you with me? It's very geographical, very physical, very Abrahamic covenant, isn't it? And it goes on like this, verse 28 in chapter 31, and it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down and overthrow and destroy and bring harm, so, in other words, in the same way, I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. Now, you can't have it both ways, by the way. Our covenantalist friends very often say that the, the yes, the, the curses upon Israel came upon them literally, but the promises of future blessing upon Israel are somehow transferred spiritually to the church. And the church has kind of replaced Israel as the people of God. And all these Old Testament promises about land and people and blessing and cities and, and restoration of the fortunes of Jacob, we interpret all that spiritually as God blessing the church. And I'd only say respectfully, you're splitting that verse in half and you're saying God cursed them physically but they don't get the blessings, they, we get the blessings and it's spiritual, that's kind of weird. But that's part of the problem with the system when you impose a system of her, a hermeneutical system upon scripture which you've in, actually invented labels for from outside of scripture. Anyway, I mustn't go there. <clears throat> then we get the new covenant in verse 31. And this is just so good because it's the, like the heart of the gospel Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Who's it going to make the new covenant with, by the way? Keep reading. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Well, that's interesting. So he's making the covenant with them. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. That's talking about the Mosaic covenant. On the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. That's the two-sided covenant. That's the bilateral covenant. That's the old covenant. The, co the Mosaic covenant at Sinai that the people of Israel broke. The one with the blessings and the curses. Obedience, blessings, disobedience, curses. All right, They're inheriting all of that. But... But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, verse 33. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and will write it on their hearts. He's going to save the house of Israel. I will be their God and they will be my people. And, and so on. And in, in verse 34 at the end, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is salvation for the nation of Israel. Wow. And it's yet yeah, it's all connected with such physical and geographical and kind of literal stuff. Look at verse 38. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord. And then he gives the, the, the landmarks of the city. And you say, well, now, was this, the, was this the restoration? Hang on a minute. Didn't Israel get restored after exile in Babylon. It, it, is this all speaking about that restoration? Well, look at the end of chapter 31. Look at verse 40. At the end, talking about the city, it shall not be uprooted or overthrown, or it shall not be plucked up or overthrown anymore forever. All right. Oh, well, that, that didn't happen, did it? So it's not talking about that restoration. Now chapter 32 comes in. We've got a date here. Tenth, in verse 1, the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. That's 587 BC. That's one year before the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile um, under the Babylonians. And Jeremiah is told to buy a field. And you're like, what's going on? Well, it's just another sign of hope. 
But the, the basic message is that I'm going to destroy Israel. Why? Look at verse 23. Um, in the latter part of verse 23, they did nothing of all you commanded them to do. Therefore you have made this disaster come upon them. Look at verse 30. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight. From their youth, the children of Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger. Verse 31, the city has this city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day. He's talking about Jerusalem. So God is going to destroy it, right? He's going to destroy Israel and he's going to destroy Jerusalem. Yes, but, verse 36, now therefore... Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, he's talking about Jerusalem, of which you say it's given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword and famine and pestilence. Verse 37, Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and wrath in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place. This place. And I will make them dwell in safety. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant, that's the new covenant, that I will not turn away from doing good to them and will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and with all my soul. For thus says the Lord, here you go, this is proof. Just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. He said, well, okay, why are you going through all this, Tom? Because I want you to I want you to feel the despair of the people of Israel as their city is burned and destroyed and the temple is burned and they are sent into exile, and most of them are killed. But I want you to know the hope that God is holding out to them here in Jeremiah 30 to 33, and the hope that he's holding out them to them here is that one day I'm going to regather you, and I'm going to renew you. I'm going to make with you an everlasting covenant. I'm going to put my law in your heart. I'm going to save you. I'm going to make you want to do what... I want you to do. I'm going to transform you as a people and I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people and you're going to live in this city, this same city, and you're going to be in this land and you're going to be the chief of nations. I will preserve my people Israel despite all their sins. You seeing a connection there? So interesting, isn't it? Because you come to chapter 33. I know I don't have time to go through it, but let's go to verse. Oh, let's go to verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. All right. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah shall be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called the Lord as our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack, lack a man to sit on the house of the sit on the throne of the house of Israel. He's looking forwards to the time when at last he restores Jesus as the Davidic king. And he's saying, I'm going to fulfill that promise I made to David. The Davidic covenant, I will fulfill it. And the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings and so on. I, I'm going to fulfill the priestly covenant that I made. I will fulfill it, he says. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, verse 20. Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the night and so that the day and my covenant with the night so that the night day and night do not come at their appointed time then also my covenant with david my servant may be broken and so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and my covenant with the levitical priests my ministers so what is god saying god is saying to all the people of israel going through those terrible terrible years you see a rainbow? 
What do you need to think? God will not forget his covenant. That means God will not forget his covenants. <laughs> that means, although I'm a slave in Babylon, although I'm a slave under the Greeks, although I'm a slave under the Romans, God will not forget his covenant. God will bring a son of David. God will bring the people of Israel back to Israel. God will fulfill his promises. That's the point, isn't it? That's the point. And he says, I'm putting all that in a sign in the sky. It just Actually, it just gets better. Go on, back to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. How are we doing for time? We don't have time, but we're going to take time. We'll go real quick, because I don't need to say much. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 54 comes after Isaiah 53. What comes before Isaiah 53? Top marks, Isaiah 52. In Isaiah 54, look at verse 9. It says, this is like the days of Noah to me. This is God speaking. As I swore that the waters of Noah shall, should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and I will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. And you say, oh, I've got that verse on my wall. It gives me great comfort. All right, take it down. It's not spoken to you. It's spoken to, it's spoken to, to Jerusalem. Spoken to Jerusalem. How, you say, how do you know that, Tom? It's because I read chapter 52. 52 gives the context. 52 starts, awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Verse 2, be seated, O Jerusalem. It's all very physical, earthly, geographical. Verse 8, the voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice together, they sing for joy, for eye to eye, they say that they see the return of the Lord to Zion, break forth into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. The Lord has redeemed Jerusalem. Verse 9, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation, and so on. Right. So actually, what God is saying in chapter 52, he picks up in chapter 54. In chapter 52, it's all about Jerusalem, the city, and God's blessing upon the city of Jerusalem. In chapter 54, it starts, Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing. Picks up from verse 9 in chapter 52. And then he goes on, and it's like, Fear not, verse 4. You're going to forget the shame of your youth, verse 4. For your maker is your husband, verse 5. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, verse 6. For a moment I deserted you. Get that language similar to, Jer to Jeremiah, right? For a moment I deserted you, but with great compassion, verse 7, I will gather you. If you're reading the LSB, verse 8 says, in a flood of anger. For a moment I hid my face from you, but, verse 8 in the middle, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah. And you're like, what's going on here? All right, God has punished his people, Israel, for their sin. He sent them into exile. But now, just like in the days of Noah, after the flood, God says, never again. God is pointing to this moment in his mind and he's saying, just like that, I've said never again about Israel and, and I'm going, I am committing myself to bless them one day and I'm going to regather them and I'm going to, my steadfast love is not, once that happens, my steadfast love is not going to depart from them. I'm making a covenant of peace with them. Verse 11, it's all to do with stones and foundations and pinnacles and verse 12 and gates in verse 12, and a wall, and it's all very physical, but this is all to do with God blessing Israel, right? And, and okay, I don't have time to go through all that, but that's kind of like what I did in Jeremiah. You can 
Do that, you go home, you read Isaiah 52, all the way through to the end of 54, and you see God, okay, what, what, what would it have meant if you were a Jew and you were wondering, is this it? Is it all over? And then you saw a rainbow. What would it have meant to you? <laughs> God hasn't given up. He's still going to keep his promise. Now, um, what comes between Isaiah 52 and 54? All right, in 53, in the end of 52, verse 13, all the way to the end of 53, is the suffering servant, isn't it? This is the kind of mystery in the Old Testament, the fact that the Messiah was going to be suffer, suffering, the fact that it was going to please the Lord to bruise him. He was going to be wounded for our transgressions. He was going to be crushed for our iniquities. He was, the Lord was going to lay on him the iniquity of us all. In the middle of, in the middle of this promise of restoration and blessing for Israel, for the city, for Jerusalem, in the middle of all of that is the mystery, you would say, of the cross, of Jesus, the Messiah, who came and, and was crucified. I want to leave you with a very simple thought. And the very simple thought is obviously the rainbow is the sign of the covenant. And when you see a rainbow, it means God will not forget his covenant. What does that mean for you as a Christian? What does that mean for you as a Christian? You're not under these old covenants, probably, any of you. <laughs> probably not under the Abrahamic covenant, unless you're a Jew. You're probably not under the priestly or the um, Davidic covenant. If you are, come and tell me later. Um, you're definitely not under the Mosaic covenant. That's the old covenant. We're not under the law. But you are under the new covenant. You are under the new covenant because Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. We as Christians get included in this plan of God to save the people of Israel. He's going to fulfill that and going to save every, every last one of them in a generation that's still to come in the future. When he comes and he saves his people Israel, just like he said, he's going to put his spirit within them. He's going to put his law in their hearts. And all those promises will come true. They're going to be regathered in Israel, but as a believing people in Israel, not like they are now. They're going to be a restored people of God in Israel. It's going to be amazing. But we get included in that, in the new covenant. We get to participate in that. That's the mystery that was hidden in the Old Testament and revealed in the new, the mystery of the church, Jew and Gentile in one body. Right now, that's, that's the way it is. So what do you think when you see a rainbow? It's, is it time for you and I to reclaim the rainbow? I reckon when you see a rainbow, you probably think gay pride. And it's pretty scary, isn't it? When you see, when you see the rainbow flag, you probably think, ooh, oh, it's kind of awkward. You see someone wearing a rainbow flag. Listen, every time you see a rainbow, even that, every time you see a rainbow, just remember, God will not forget his covenant. He will not fail. And you know, the proof of that you have as a Christian is far greater than anything any believer has ever had before. Why? Because we're living in the days when Isaiah 53 has been fulfilled. You and I know that not only has God put a rainbow in the sky to say, I will keep my covenants, I will not forget my covenants, but he sent his son to the cross to say, look, I'm fulfilling it all. We have the, we have the covenants of God promised, and we've yet to see all these covenants, the covenant to Abraham, the covenant to David, the covenant to the Levites, the Breezley covenant. We've yet to see all that come to fruition. Most of that is still future to be fulfilled. But we have the cross. 
We know that God has sealed it with his own blood. We know that he's gone so far as to sacrifice his own son. And we know if he's done that, he's not going to fail to fulfill his covenants. Is he? Is he? Father in heaven, we pray that you, oh God, would help us to trust you. We're ashamed of our unbelief. Lord, when we see how wonderfully you've put together your word, how you've told us everything that we need to know and given us so, much, so many reasons to trust you completely. We are ashamed of our unbelief. Lord, please forgive us. Help us to fix our eyes upon you. And we pray for anyone today who's struggling and just wondering, could this all be true? Should I be repenting and believing? Lord, help them to do so. Help us, Lord, to leave our sin and to lay aside the things that encumber us, to run with endurance the race that is before us. Help us to do so for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.